So we are recording. Uh, welcome everyone. Today we'll be speaking with George Soroy. He's an international best-selling author, co-founder of the Winding Trails Media Podcasting Network, President Emeritus of the Missouri Writers Guild, voice actor, and audiobook narrator. So before we welcome George, I want to remind everyone of a few logistics. The call is being recorded and you'll receive a link to the call tomorrow on Friday. Please mute yourself on your end so as to avoid any background noise. Please find your chat button. Um, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but it's down at the bottom of your screen. Look for the thought bubble with the three little dots. If you have any questions, please type them into that chat box and we'll get to them throughout the call. The, we promise to end the call around 12.15, no later than 12.30, so that we can all get back to the business of the day. George Soroy is the author of the international best-selling young adult science fiction novel, Excelsior. It's sequel, Ever Upward, part two in the Excelsior journey, and the five-part science fiction sports serial from Parts Unknown. He was elected vice president of the Missouri Writers Guild in 2016 and served as president in 2017 through 18. In 2018, he co-founded the Winding Trails Media Podcasting Network with St. Louis Writers Guild president David Allen Lucas, and his own weekly show, Excelsior Journeys, is dedicated to putting the spotlight on creative people currently on their path to success. So George and I had a phone call conversation a week or so ago, a couple weeks ago, when we first talked about doing today's interview, and he told me that in 2015, sorry, he learned of a voice class that was being taught at the Clayton Studios in St. Louis along Big Bend. A lot of you may be familiar with that. So George created a successful Kickstarter campaign to raise funds for these lessons with renowned, renowned voice actor Jim Singer and to record both a commercial and animation demo. Under his By George, He's Got It banner, he has gone on to narrate and produce various novels, novellas, short stories, and PowerPoint presentations. He's also edited audiobooks for other narrators, including the award-winning novel Kubrick's Game by Derek Taylor Kent, and he has spoken about audiobook production for the Missouri Writers Guild, St. Louis Writers Guild, Saturday Writers, and the St. Louis Publishers Association. Welcome, George. Hello. Hello. Thank Hello. you so much for having me. And I, I must say also, you helped one of our authors. Um, man, I see his face and it just jumped, his name jumped out of my head. Cal Thompson. Cal Thompson. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you helped Cal with his audio and we'll talk about that a little bit more also. I'm just thrilled that you could be with us here today. Um, I know you met my husband, Jack, at one of the uh, St. Louis Publisher Association meetings, I believe. Yes, yes. It was, uh, there were, it, was, uh, it was a great group of people that were there, and everyone seemed to be very much into what I had to say, so I really appreciated that. Awesome. So what is it about voice acting that attracted you into this as a career? I have always been really kind of into animation and all the different voices of animation. It's just been something that I uh, have always really um, applied myself to. I, I, was, I was somebody who, you know, like I grew up in the 80s, so I had all these great different um, animated series waiting for me when I would get home from school. I would have, there would be a bunch still on Saturday mornings, and I was always keeping an eye on the different voice actors. And when I was 10 years old and my uncle took me to see Transformers the movie um, back in 1986, I, this was the first time that I actually got to see a full credit list of all the voice actors because during the closing credits of the shows, it would just be like a list of, vo of actors who were doing the voices. And there, I have no idea who's who. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that it was, you know, Jack Angel who was doing Astro Train or Peter Cullen who was doing Ironhide or, you know, Frank Welker who was doing pr pretty much everyone else. And, um, but this was the first time that I actually got to see what everyone was doing. I got to see that Peter Cullen was the voice of both Optimus Prime and Ironhide. I got to see that Frank Welker was the voice of Soundwave and Megatron. I got to see Chris Lotta, God rest his soul, as the voice of Starscream and all these wonderful names. It was just like all of a sudden I had just, it, was, it felt like the door was cracked open just a little bit for me, just to see what was going on behind the scenes. And it was always something that I really wanted to focus on. And I even... Um, you know, as, you know, as I, you know, studied theater and everything in, in uh, high school and college, 
that was always something that I, that really attracted me. I always wanted to be a part of that in some way. And I feel, feel like doing audiobooks and doing voice acting for other gigs. It seems like that's my, that's kind of like my in, because if you're, if you want to do animation, you have to do, I, you have to be in either New York or Los Angeles. Yeah. I already did my time in New York, but that was it. So real quick, I just want to give you a chance here. There's a crackling going on, like maybe one of your plugs or your wires is not quite plugged in. I just oh. wanted to let you know about that. Um, there's let, a, me, you know, let me give this a shot real quick. Hold on. Yeah, the, there was a lot of static coming through. How about now? Is that better? Um, well, let's keep talking. Let's try it. My, yeah, it, it, there was some static when you were playing with that chord, so... I think you identified where it was coming from. But so you, okay, you, mentioned, you mentioned, let's just keep talking. I'll let you know if I hear any more. Okay. Uh, you mentioned theater. So have you always had a theater background? Uh, yeah. Uh, when, I was, when I was growing up in Poughkeepsie, I was, I was basically just kind of put into the drama club uh, at a very early age. It was something that, um, that was kind of always pigeonholed basically like for me. It was just like, okay, he's got this kind of, you know, style to him and everything. He's, he's going to do well here. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then in, um, through second through sixth grade or so, it was always something that was just a part of what I would do. Um, I was always involved in like the drama club after school and it was always working on different projects or something. And then in sixth grade, I wound up, you know, going through a really rough period where I actually was reading something that I had written to the entire school and lost my place. And for about like about five, six seconds or so, like I was frozen mm -hmm. and it was, it felt so embarrassing. I think we've that all when I, yeah. Yeah. And then when I made the move to, uh, to Richmond, Virginia, back, you know, for seventh, before seventh grade, I wasn't getting anywhere near the stage until junior year in high school when it was basically, I was asked to help out with the junior class stunt talent night and come up with a concept for the actual show because the show was all set where um, every, you know, the money that was raised for this talent show would go toward paying for the senior prom. So it was up to the juniors to do a, the best job possible to get that out there. So we did. And it was a, bi a big part of it was because I had come up with the right concept that they right. were able to take and run with. But then I wrote and, um, and actually wound up performing a piece that I had written myself and it, I had to be talked into performing it and I wound up doing it for the very first time at dress rehearsal so the very next night was was the show was the night of the show mm -hmm. and there I am for the first time in five years getting up on stage and I felt like as soon as I did that all of that angst that I was holding on to all that fear just went away That's awesome. and it just felt like yeah. this is where I belong this is really where I belong I love that feeling yeah yeah so I know you, you, you train through Clayton Studios, which is highly renowned in our area and, and beyond. And so tell us about the first audio book that you recorded. What, how did you make that connection and get started in the audio book side? It really came down to my publisher letting me put together a little test for her. Um, at that time, I was, I was published through Rocking Horse Publishing, which is based out of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And Originally, my, my book Excelsior was self-published, and then when uh, when she was looking for uh, when she was looking for submissions, I went ahead and submitted mine, and just feeling that I felt like I'd kind of hit the wall regarding the self-published world, and I wanted to see what else would happen if somebody else had invested in me and really kind of pushed me out there, and that wound up working really well to my advantage because I wound up doing very very well for for her, for myself. And um, it was around that time, like around, you know, like about two years after I had done the, uh, I started up with uh, Rocking Horse Publishing, that I wanted, that I had finished up everything that I was doing with Clayton Studios. I had done the, all the lessons with Jim Singer. I had recorded my demos. And now it was just like, okay, now let's see what I can do. And so I basically said, I'd like to make an audiobook of my own novel. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I just put together a, a, a quick chapter, let you know how it sounds? She said, fine. I did the chapter and it wound up being so well received that she just said, go for it. And then if Rocking Horse Publishing was still going, 
she actually wanted me to be like the de facto audiobook narrator for other works in the Rocking Horse catalog. Yeah. So I must have done something right. Awesome. And so I noticed your setup there. What can you tell us about that? I know um, I see padding on the walls. I see yes. lots of equipment in front of you. Tell us a little bit about this room that you've set up there for recording. Uh, well, a big shout out goes to my father-in-law for, um, for, for doing this. He basically took the whole area that's right behind the staircase leading to our basement and bumped it out enough so that way I have some space to operate and created my studio. He just drywalled the whole thing. He set up, uh, he set up a little you know, cubby hole area right underneath the countertop where my uh, laptop is now resting. And I have a, um, because I wound up um, at my, one of my previous jobs, I had gotten a very generous referral fee for getting someone, um, getting someone into a particular position. So I got to use that money to get my new equipment. So I have a Rode NT1A microphone and that runs like a little over $200 um, on Amazon. I also have a microphone stand, which runs about like, I would say like about $50. Um, I have a, uh, I have my Kindle Fire, uh, which runs a little over fifty dollars, fifty between seven fifty and seventy five. It's uh, one of these seven inch tablets, so that way I don't have to rustle pages while I'm turning them. I can just mm -hmm. use the finger to scroll. Um, I also have my uh, laptop connected to the whole thing, and I also have a USB interface, so that way, um, so so I have something that basically connects from the microphone here to the interface and then from the interface goes uh, hooks up to the computer um, and I basically line the entire room with acoustic foam and um, I even have like this uh, you know some acoustic foam surrounding the microphone itself just for the for the sake of it and I also have a carpet sample resting on the um, the music stand that I have and I have my Kindle resting on that um, I also have a monitor that's right in front of me so that way that gives me a, um, a better view of um of how audacity is recording everything so i highly recommend if anyone else wants to really kind of get in this and see how they do it use audacity as your as your recording software because more than anything it's incredibly user-friendly and free that's the big one there yeah, it's the free there. so is yeah. this um you know is, is this an easy setup that you would recommend someone just go out and turn a, a large closet area or a small room into a recording studio or what are the pros and cons of someone producing their own audio book or hiring someone to do it for them? Well, the pros, um, mainly it's that uh, you, you know your own work. You know how your characters' names are pronounced and you know how you want that particular story to be told. You can hear it in your head as you're writing it. So you actually get to perform it as, as you go. Um, now it's not for everyone. I've heard a couple of couple of people try their hands at this, and um, their voices just aren't strong enough. And you have to make sure that you have some that you have some force to your voice, something that's going to demand the attention of the listener. Because I've I've told this to several other people that um, that I've spoken with. You're basically going to be whispering sweet nothings in, the, in your listeners' ears for about seven hours. And you wanna make sure that every second of that is worth it. Um, so you have to be prepared to not only do all the narrating yourself, but you also have to make sure that you're doing all the editing yourself and make sure that you cover all the bases regarding your any sort of mistakes, uh, any sort of background noise, you can probably hear just like a, a distant hum right now in the background over here. The reason why you can hear that is because I did not turn the air conditioner off because I want you to hear what, what the microphone will pick up. Right. Um, and once that, whenever I'm doing like actual like audiobook recording, that gets turned off. Um, and so that way everything, all the sort of background noise is off. Um, I make sure that uh, that this room. I made sure that this room is very well padded, so it soaks up a lot of as much sound as possible. And uh, later on in June, when uh, when the basement gets fixed, uh, when the basement gets finished, there is going to be some lining on the inside, on the other side of that as well. So that will help out even more. 
Um, but uh, but right now, I feel like with uh, with all of this combined with the uh, moving blanket that my wife was able to coerce from uh, from a mover uh, earlier this year, um, that that basically kind of drapes over the counter area. Um, I, I feel like it's, it's yeah. oh yeah, it softens everything really nicely. And I've been able to use this not only for recording any sort of audio books, but also recording of my podcasts as well. So this so has been someone, very handy. Yeah, so if an author um, decides they want to do their own recording, I know there's two things I want to cover. What if, yeah. I would like to talk about if an author decides they want to do their own recording. And then I also want to talk about what if an author decides they want you to do recording for them. So uh, one and kind of to lead into those, both of that conversation is um, I remember listening to an audio book in my car and it was a fairly high profile author in the self-help movement. And yeah. about halfway through the audio tape, the volume or the audio changed and you could tell it, it was almost as if they'd had, more than one session of recording and he was recording it himself or he was his uh, voice. and by the time it gets to or before it gets to retail is there a way to fix that so that you don't have to sit there for seven hours and read your book out loud i mean oh there is yeah. you want to take a break in there somewhere right oh yeah yeah i strongly recommend that if you start to feel and you know tired in any way you definitely need to step away and take a break i recommend like uh basically recording i would say about an hour and then take a break before your voice gets get shows any sign of weakness um take a break get hydrated um just you know do some breathing exercises and just kind of relax yourself so that way when you sit back in front of the microphone you're able to jump right back into it yeah. um there is uh the wonderful thing about uh about the requirements on Audible, which is Amazon's um, audiobook wing, mm -hmm. uh, they do this thing. They do th this their whole DIY setup, or you know, um, recruiting a uh, narrator to do it for them. Uh, their site is called ACX Audiobook Creation Exchange, and they have three specific requirements um, that uh, that need to that that need to be taken care of before it can move into the whole processing and putting up on their site. Uh, the first one is RMS, which means root mean square. And that is, that is a term that, uh, that you definitely, that's uh, it's definitely like a sound related term that comes off as very intimidating, but at the same time, there are different, there are different elements, there are different add on tools for audacity that basically allow you to, um, to manually, alter your sound file so that way it fits with their specifications for rms you can uh, they also, those, that volume issue yeah, yeah. Um, there's also noise floor they want to make sure that uh, that there's no background noise or as little as possible that's that's surrounding you that the microphone might pick up and then there's also peak volume because the one thing that they really don't want um because so the overall the majority of the people who are listening to audible files are going to be in their car last thing they need to hear is all of a sudden bah you know it's like the sudden burst yeah that will that will distract the listener mm -hmm. there is a there is a means of basically taking the whole file and limiting the peak volume so that way i like to i like to set it up as a negative four if you do that, then everything, you can still have that outburst, but it automatically kind of like lowers the volume a little bit to that. So that way it kind of matches the volume of everything else that's going on around it. So you still have that emotional reading, but at the same time, you're not driving people off the road gotcha. you know, by, by mistake because of it. So if someone um, wanted to use their own voice to record their own book, um, how, what would be the logistics of that? Uh, would they come to your studio? Would they go to another studio and then have you help them with the logistics of getting it set up on Amazon? How does that work? If, uh, if they are to record themselves and say, recruit me to do the editing, mm -hmm. that's fine. Um, the only thing that I can't do is I can't have people recording at my home because I have two dogs, a Pomeranian and a mini Aussie shepherd. We are their third owners. 
and they're kind of psychotic when it comes to, when it comes to uh, when it comes to barking and uh, having guests in the house. As soon as they know that there is someone downstairs working on something, then they are just going to bark and bark and bark and bark and bark, and you're basically not going to have very much useful material to work with. Um, so I would I would uh, I'd be happy to kind of walk people through with uh, getting their setups. Mm -hmm. You can do it, you can do a very, very inexpensive setup without going to the level of extremes that I did. Um, what so you can do- to set up a recording area similar to what you have, um, would their investment be 500 or 1,000? Or let's say they already have a closet or a small room. Um, what kind of investment are they looking at? If they have a closet, if they have something that, uh, that they feel like they can, um, that they can feel comfortable working in, uh, then it's actually not as expensive as you think. It could be as little as, you know, under a hundred dollars oh, because okay. more than, more likely they're going to have either a computer or a laptop already handy. Mm -hmm. Um, if they're going to be re pre uh, recording in their closet, I strongly recommend a laptop because yeah. it's going to come up, it's going to have uh, less noise and it's going to be much more portable for you. Yeah. Uh, so I would suggest, uh, basically just getting yourself a, a USB microphone uh, without having to worry about the USB interface. Um, something that, that connects directly into the, um, into the laptop. One of the things that I did is I got myself a, a blue snowball ice microphone for recording my first audiobook, And that was, that came out to like just between like 50 and $60. Um, it's still a, a very good microphone, works great for me for other, for other projects. If there's something that I need to do outside of my studio, uh, which I'm likely going to have to do in June when this, uh, when this whole basement area is getting finished. Uh, thankfully, I still have that. And I also still have the, uh, the little mini booth that I put together, which is basically getting one of those felt fold up boxes that you can get from, I think, I think we got ours from Ikea and it has a grommet on, uh, on the front of it. What I did was I basically made that the spot where the cord comes out. And so that way it connects right up to my laptop. I had, and I also lined the entire mini booth with mattress foam. So that whole thing, that whole operation ran me like maybe 10 bucks or so mm -hmm. at the most. And then the, US, the USB snowball ice microphone fits right inside there. And that cuts out a lot of background noise. Yeah. If you're doing that along with being in a closet, so that way you're kind of away from the rest of your house, so you're not getting any other extra natural noise being picked up, then you're on the right path. You, you definitely are. And um, there will be a little bit of finagling when you're doing the editing. There will be some noise removal that you'll likely need to do. But if you use that noise removal um, tool a little too much, then you're going to wind up muffling your own voice during the editing. And you, want, you don't want to do that. You want to yeah. use that noise remo uh, removal tool, I would say once would just be fine before yeah. you move on to the other items. That's a quick question. Um, so if, because I know some of our listeners may not be technology oriented, and if they decide they want to use their voice and don't want to set up their own booth at home, sound booth to do this, um, do you recommend they go to a professional studio similar to Clayton Studios where you trained? I, I would recommend that, but I would also recommend that, um, that they speak with uh, Steve Moore over at Clayton Studios first um, because uh, to see if, you know, how they can set up the, the right kind of schedule. Because one thing I don't want them to do is to basically use all of their money on scheduling these appointments because it can be a little pricey uh when it when it comes to when it comes to recording inside a studio mm -hmm. with uh with cal thompson um his book was maybe maybe a little over an hour so it worked really well for him so that way he could sit down and work with an editor and the editor actually already did a lot of the work for me um so basically what i had to do when i uh worked with him was make sure that the files were ACX compatible so that way when they are all said, when everything was all said and done, he can go ahead and upload it to Amazon without any problems. And so then you can upload it and, and walk, them, walk the author through that process of how to get it uploaded to Amazon and Audible. Absolutely, That's yeah. Awesome.
So yeah. now um, let's take a look at if someone wants you to do the voice, because I know um, one of our authors is Martha Beck, and she's a, a, a fairly high profile author. But if you've ever heard her speak, she has a very high pitched squeaky voice and she's the mm -hmm. first to admit it. And yeah. her audio books are all read by another female voice. But I was noticing because I've heard Martha speak several times in person and in, in listening to her audio books, the person that did her, the woman that did her audio books caught on to some of Martha's what was speaking cadence, I guess. I don't know if that's the correct terminology, but mm -hmm. some of her speech patterns to where after a while, sometimes you think you really are listening to Martha rather than oh, wow. the person doing the voiceover. So how do you, let's talk about that a little bit on, on if someone were to, if an author came to you and wanted you to read their book and create an audio book for them, what is that process? What's like, take us through the first six steps or something. Uh, well, the first the first step more than anything would be basically like the offer um, for me to do it, which I you know would obviously you know be happy to. Um, I would also want to make sure that this uh, that this particular project would work for me um, in terms of am I the right kind of voice for that pro that project? Now, obviously, whatever they say, they have the final say, but at the same time, I don't want. I wouldn't want them to bring me in just because I do this and not because I'm the right voice. Right. Um, because more often than not, you know, like I'll, you know, there'll be someone saying like, can you, can you read this? My main character is a female. It's like, well, kind of, you know, it, it would probably behoove the story and the process and everything better. If the, if the act, the actor that you bring in to do the narrating is a female. Mm -hmm. um, then it's basically just a matter of, you know, making sure that the terms are, are agreed upon. And for me, it's, um, I charge $150 per finished hour, uh, with a minimum of two hours. So if, uh, if somebody basically just like hands me a kid's book for me to narrate, um, normally, um, uh, audiobook narrators go by per finished hour, which means that when all is said and done, when everything is recorded and all the edits and everything are all done, that first hour of re of recorded material that's out there on Audible, that is a finished hour. So say um, Excelsior was just over seven hours total. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be say, you know, like under $50 times seven, you know, so, um, and so on and so on. So, um, now there are options that ACX offers that work really well for a lot of, a lot of uh, authors that are out there that have a very restricted budget. Um, this was something that I used to be able to participate in, but I cannot, you know, for, for the near future, just because, um, I really need to make sure that I am, you know, making this worth my while. Um, the big thing that they offer with uh with acx is they get they give you two options when it comes to working with a different with a different producer um they would either pay them outright which is basically just the author paying the, the audiobook narrator slash producer because they're likely the one one and the same and then that author keeps all the rights but then the other option is what they call a royalty share which is when since 60% of every purchase goes to Amazon, 40% normally would go to the author. But in this case, for a royalty share, it gets split down the middle. So the author gets 20% and the producer gets 20%. And it basically, it becomes a mutually beneficial thing because if the finished product is a success mm -hmm. and, if, and if both the producer and the author really promote as much as they can out of it, then that's only going to be beneficial for both of them. However, they are only splitting, you know, they're, they're getting that 40% split. So they each get, so they each get uh, 20% each. So I just want to clarify that a minute. So does ACX offer producer slash voiceover people talent? They um, basically like if um, like I, I am part of that. I'm on the, I'm on ACX as an audiobook producer. Okay. You can look up my name, you'll find me there. Um, and 
if you have something specifically that you feel that my voice would work for, you can offer it to me, mm -hmm. which would be very flattering. I would, you know, love, would love that. Um, there are also, um, there's also the, uh, the capability of finding other um, producers who would be able to do it for you as well. And that would be basically just opening your story to auditions. And what you would do for that is you would put together a small sample of your work and you would set that up as a separate Word document and upload that to your page on ACX. So that way, everyone who tries to chime in and everything, they would have the capability to just go ahead and grab that, record it, send it over to you, and then you can listen to all the different people that have submitted their work and then decide on which one is going to get it. And those producers will say on there whether, they're, whether they are open to royalty shares or whether they would require a flat rate, a flat fee. So if someone wanted to go out and check out the ACX website, um, is it just acx.com? Correct, yeah. Okay. And then I, I do want to remind everybody that if you have specific questions for George today, to please type them into your chat box and we'll make sure we get those answered. Um, now if, so I know some of our listeners are here in St. Louis and some are not. I, I saw Tyrone jump on a second ago and I know he's either gonna be in Miami or New York. So hi Tyrone, you can wave a little there. Hi, glad you could join us today, hi. So the, um, in each area, wherever someone's checking in from today, I'm sure there's going to be studios or people that can help them. And what are some things that, what are some questions that we could offer for authors to make sure that they ask in interviewing a producer slash voice talent? What are some definite questions to know that this is a reputable person that will be giving me a high quality product? Um, well, the first thing that I would, I would ask is, um, is how you know have they worked with other speakers before because in the case of kubrick's game the main reason why i was brought on board to help with getting that project on its feet was because um when derek put it together he worked with um he was he had done all the producing and everything with a uh, with someone out in california the problem is is that that person only had experience working with bands and when you're doing the mixing and the finalizing with, with everything you need to do for an audiobook, it's a very different process from working with bands. Yeah, okay. Right. And so the overall, the files that he got back were basically non-usable. So I had to take those and basically just try my best to fit the, this square peg into the round hole. Mm -hmm. And somehow it worked. And I'm really glad it did because the narrator that he had gotten for that project was Jonathan Frakes, who was Commander Riker from Star Trek The Next Generation. And so when he told me that, I was just like, I get to work with, a, with something that Jonathan Frakes did? Yes, I'll definitely you know, like help out however I can. And it wound up being a really good thing because it, um, because it not only wound up getting acclaim, um, but it also wound up winning the reader's favorite award for best audiobook and so when Derek got those medals for everyone he made sure to send me one and I always appreciate that you know that was that was a great thing to be recognized for for doing that mm -hmm. so I, I did have a, another question you mentioned earlier about ACX and having people send you audiobooks so I know that sometimes um, and if it were me I, I sometimes zone out when we start getting too highly technical and that mm -hmm. that side of my brain just doesn't function. Um, right. But so if, if someone, tell me a little bit, what is the difference between a producer and for, because this is all new territory for me also. So you have the different players. So you have the author, you have the producer, you have the voice person. Um, mm -hmm. What are each of those roles? Uh, well, obviously the author is the one that provides the material. Mm -hmm. The narrator is the is the one who is recording the material. Uh, now, if someone has a separate person acting as a producer, then they take that raw material, 
they go ahead and take out any of the, any mistakes. They do the noise removal where it's necessary. They do all of the adjusting for the RMS normalizing, for all of the limiting. Um, make sure that the noise floor is as um, as minimal as possible, and get it ready for for distribution. Now, um, obviously, when um, obviously the the products that you know that I put together, I make sure that they're ACX compliant. I guarantee that in my um, in my uh, in my contracts. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure that they are that they are as good as possible for the highest the highest market because Audible reach, you know, these files will go out to Audible, they'll go out to Amazon, they'll go out to iTunes, and which is the three main places where you can download an audiobook. Now, in uh, there are some cases where um, there are other, there are other uh, different kinds of companies like Find Away Voices that also do, they also like work with libraries. Authors Republic is also one that does that. And they, you know they do the same thing they 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 do audiobooks and they also spread it out to the wider market but at the same time the main three that you really want to make sure you conquer are amazon audible itunes because that's the majority of where everyone any gets. of those three the the main players do they also supply to libraries uh those three do not it's okay. uh, authors, Re authors republic does um yeah. which is which is obviously a great thing um now what um now with uh, when it comes to when it comes to Amazon, if you want to basically set up your yourself so that way you can submit to libraries, then you would be doing a non-exclusive contract with Amazon, which means that instead of 40% uh, that you'd be getting, you'd be getting only 25%. Gotcha. But you would also, but you know, like hopefully that difference is made up with all the other yeah, sales, the, yeah. the other, the other, the other sales and, um, and, um, exposure that you would be getting through sites like Authors Republic or Find Away Voices. Find Away Voices just recently signed up uh, signed up a contract working with Smashwords, so they're okay. they're getting into that game as well. So Smashwords is always also it sounds like they're going into auto audio. Oh yeah, yeah, and so, you want to make sure that uh, just one thing like um, when what I want to do is I always want to make sure that that all of my files that I send out or record myself are ACX compliant. So that way that type of quality is the same with everyone else because they really have the right idea when it comes to what they're looking for. Yeah. They're not just doing it just for their own specific things. They, they, have, they have a reason why they want those, uh, those specific um, changes made to the files when they're done. So that yeah. way it provides the best possible listening experience for the, you know, for the listener. So you've talked off and on about percentage of sales. Can you talk a little bit about how do we know how to price our audiobook? Um, well, actually, what Audible will do, and and really, you know, like the most experience that I have is working with ACX and Audible. So um, they will price it automatically. Um, now, I believe either Authors Republic or Find Away Voices allows you to set your own price, um, but you have to make sure that you're get that you're getting you're getting your worth, um, especially if you are doing the narrating yourself, which means that you are reaping the benefits of being the author and the producer, mm -hmm. and you're getting that entire cut. Um, so is there a make, range of pricing or how does, what does it usually get priced as? Normally when it comes to, you know, like uh, just using Excelsior as, as an example, since that came out to like just over seven hours, that, is priced on Amazon and Audible and iTunes as seventeen ninety five. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you take advantage of the offer that uh, that they have to set up WhisperSync, WhisperSync is one of those great things that you never knew you needed until you found out that it exists. And what that what that is is it packages your ebook and your audiobook as one big bundle. And by doing that, it allows you to read the ebook on your own, and then when you want to switch over to audio, you can put it on Audible, and it'll pick up where you left off. Oh, wow. Read, which is a really cool tr uh, trick. Yeah. And another great thing that it does, and this is a huge benefit for, um, for audiobook listeners, is that it greatly reduces the price of the actual audiobook. Um, so if you were to get Excelsior on ebook for 4 dollars 
you would be getting the audiobook for only an additional seven forty nine, which is much much better than seventeen ninety nine. But the great thing is, is that I'm not shortchanging myself when it comes to the royalties. Right. I'm still getting the royalties of a seventeen ninety nine purchase. Okay. Very cool. Okay, so that that's really is a bit that whisper sync is really is a, a benefit then. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now, does anyone? I mean, how? I'm trying to figure out the best way to ask this. So you have audio that you can download from iTunes or Amazon or Audible, and Correct. Then, do you ever still get requests for people to have their recorded book on CDs? Um. I have with, um, I did with, um, with Cal actually, um, I was able to send, um, send that info and everything, you know, through him, I was able to, um, just send him, we had an agreement where I would just basically send him the finished MP3s and he would do whatever he wanted with them because he was paying me outright. So however he wanted to do it. And that's, that was the case with, um, with my, um, my latest client as well. I've done three different uh, works for this particular client. I've done two novellas and, an, and a full novel with him. And each one, I would just send him the finished MP3s via Dropbox. And he would go ahead and do whatever he wanted with them because he was paying me for my time gotcha. and he was paying me for my, for my work. So then if and he had so, the equipment, he could burn his own CDs and make his own labels and all that. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then he could which, which he does. or so. give it away as a, a gift or whatever he wanted. Yeah. yeah. It's up, it's up to him however he wants to do it. As long as I get paid, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, so I did want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat box. And so George, um, do you have any upcoming projects that you can tell us a little bit about that you're looking forward to jumping into? Um, well, yeah, actually I do because, uh, I mean, the Excelsior Journeys podcast is going very well. Um, I, you know, uh, a new episode launches every Tuesday and I've been, uh, use, I've been getting this opportunity to speak with so many great talented people that aren't getting the kind of credit that they deserve. Um, I also got to basically realize that a lot of them are lifelong friends of mine, people that I've known through all different walks of life, whether they were in grade school or middle school or high school or college or someone that I worked with, you know, somewhere in the past. Um, That is, I've been able to interview them because they all have a lot to offer. Um, But what I'm going to be doing between now and uh, September in addition to trying to get the third part of my Excelsior trilogy done um, and written and everything. I also want to record the audiobook for Ever Upward, part two in the Excelsior journey. I'd also like to give... These these are the books that you have authored yourself, correct? Correct, correct. I'm doing that and I'm also doing... um, Since since I own all the rights, you know, flat out to From Parts Unknown, my uh, five-part sci-fi sports serial, I have basically just used that as kind of like a template of like, well, let's see what else I can do with this. And so in addition to releasing them as one big volume on Amazon and then having them available for separate purchases on Smashwords, I am also going to be doing an audiobook of From Parts Unknown, but I'm going to be setting it up as a podcast. So it will be released chapter by chapter one week at a time. And to, uh, to, to allow for, for me to kind of get into the fiction podcast game, which I think it'll be a lot of fun. Which will also is, is a good suggestion for some of our nonfiction listeners in that, um, or I guess, is that an option for them to where they could do a chapter at a time? And, it is. It, yeah. they, they do have that option, yes. And um, and if they were to do that, you know, I would I would recommend working with um, w- w- with a host. I would suggest would be Podbean, uh, P O D B E A N, um, because what they allow is they allow a free tier that gives you. I want to say the tier is about five hours of material per month, uh, with a um, with a total. Uh, with a total bandwidth of about, I think, I think the, their number is 500 gigs. And you can, uh, you can put that together very nicely um, if you do a chapter by chapter mm-hmm. um, read, because chapters usually will take, will obviously be taking less than an hour. Some 
the majority of chapters are like about a half hour or so each. And so you're able to take that and um, take that and release it. Now, the only thing that they won't do that the free tier of Podbean won't do is it won't allow you to schedule the podcast. So um, you would only say like, um, say if, if I had Excelsior Journeys up on Tuesdays, you know, every Tuesday as I do, I, I have to wait until Tuesday before I upload it because I can't just upload it and then say it's going to go live on this date. That's for the, uh, the paid tiers for Podbean, and gotcha. which is what I'm using with now. Well, you've offered some unbelievable, fascinating information today. I thank you so much for being with us. And I haven't had any questions pop up, um, but I do want to thank everyone for being here with us. And if you do have any additional questions, we will be sending, for George, we will be sending out an email tomorrow that has, George, your um, contact information in it if they want to direct any questions to you directly. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And George, especially to you for taking the time today. And I love that setup today. That would be a, a, a great photo for one of your, your covers on your audios. Yeah, all he needs is better lighting and I'm good to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. So thank yep. you, everyone, for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye, guys. See you next month. Bye-bye.